Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Nick Osborne, who's been a copywriter and direct response marketer for over 35 years. He, you look young, Nick. He has worked with <laughs> dozens of major companies, including Citibank, Apple, New York Times, and many more. He's spoken at conferences and done in-house trainings for companies like Yahoo, Walt Disney Attractions, and several others. He was the winner of the AWAI Copywriter of the Year, joining past winners that include Dan Kennedy, Ted Nicholas, Bob Bly, Richard Armstrong. Three of those four have been interviewed by me also. I was one of the... He, <laughs> Nick was one of the very first to recognize and teach that writing for the web is fundamentally different from white writing from print. And it seems obvious today, but back in the 90s, it wasn't so much. And his book, Net Words, was published by McGraw-Hill in 2002 and was the first books published on the subject of online writing and copywriting. Nick, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you're welcome. Happy to be here. I'm excited to hear your big lessons, and you know, just from the intro, when you when I wrote that, I had several questions just from that, um, not including all the other ones I have. But so, how is writing for the web different, and what are some of the big mistakes people make? Um, I think it's, and, and this is lessons from the '90s. Is yeah. You know, I used to, I'd come across companies back then that literally, when they were building their website, like the first version of their website back in the mid, sort of late 90s, uh, you know, they were cutting and pasting stuff from print, mm. from from their catalogs, from other I print see. materials they had, and they were just pasting it into the web. And when you do that, when you read on the web stuff that was written for print, well, obviously, it, it's like very formal, it's very, feels like it's very long. And it just feels odd because uh, this is a very different medium, and, right. and we see it today even more than back then. This is like, really? a, hey, well, th th this 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 medium belongs more to the user than it does to the marketer. You know, we're dominated by you know Facebook and Twitter and mm -hmm. YouTube and stuff. I mean, most content is is user created rather than marketer created. So yeah. so users have defined their own way of. What sounds natural, what feels natural in mm -hmm. terms of everything. And when a marketer comes in old school, it just it doesn't fit. It just sounds odd. And also there's a usability issue. The usability, you know, if you're leafing through a catalog, uh, um, for instance, leafing through, well, leafing through a website. So you have to take all of this into account and you know, have stuff online so that it feels natural. Mm -hmm. So what are some big mistakes people are making today in writing online? Well, and I, I guess specifically, of, you, I was watching an interview with you and you talked about specifically writing homepage sales, breaking down different ways to write for homepages, sales pages. What are some, if you break down those two, what are some big mistakes people make writing on their homepage and on their sales page? Well, I think the first mistake writers uh, make and the marketing group at the client company makes is they fail to ask a very simple question, which is, what is the purpose of this page? Mm -hmm. And that particularly applies to home pages because a lot of home pages you know, are still about the company. Well, what is the purpose of that home page? The purpose of actually every single home page on the planet is to get someone to click. You know, if nobody gets past your home page, you fail. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to get them somewhere where they're going to buy, they're going to subscribe, they're going to right. click on an ad, they're going to do something. Right. Um, you can't succeed. So the purpose of the homepage yeah. is to engage people, get them interested, and move them forward. That's the purpose. Right. Uh, once you recognize that, everything changes. If you don't recognize that, you tend to write one of those boring homepages all about the company and how, how spiffy and spectacular we are as a company. And nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, that can be a problem. That's a good um, point. That's a good point. What did you do with one of the your clients that had a horrible homepage, and then what did you do to change it? What was an example? Well, I'll, th I'll think of a, uh, a, a a very kind of formal, fairly dry example. It was an insurance company mm -hmm. uh, out of the Midwest. Not a, not one of the top five, but probably one of the top twenty mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. 
and they had that that same deal is we've been looking after our customers for 123 years and, and like you know <laughs> right. just self-serving nonsense about the company and it's not why people came there what is the purpose if why did someone come that to that page they came because they wanted some insurance or maybe some investment advice because they kind of straddled insurance and investment products as well uh, well, why did someone come to that page? Because they want to compare or they want to find out about or they want to get pricing for an insurance product. So what, what, what I say, said to that company is I said, look, what are, you know, 80, I, I said, my guess is that 80% of your visitors to your homepage or 80% of the people coming to your website are after one of three, maybe four things. And they said, well, yeah, that's true. How did you know that? And I said, because it's almost always the case is, mm -hmm. is that, you know, you tend to, you know, you do your blah, blah, blah about your company. And then you say, here are 350 products. Well, it's not what people want. Out of those 350, there are usually three or four that 80% of people actually are looking for. So I said, you tell me what they are and I'll redo your homepage. Mm -hmm. So I, I redid the homepage so that it wasn't company centric, it was visitor centric. It was all about the visitor and about how they could help the visitor. And, and then I just had these three boxes, squares and a horizontal line saying, hey, how can we help you in this area, this area or this area? And now I'd pleased 80% of people coming to the site, whereas previously 100% mm -hmm. were disappointed. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's it's not it, it wasn't a hard job in a sense, mm -hmm. um, but it, and, and I'm not saying that I'm super smart and that the company was super stupid. It's just that from a company point of view, it can be very hard to change your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I guess you need that outside about. perspective looking that's in right. to change. That's right. So so that's mainly what I do with home pages. Is mm -hmm. first of all simplify them, and mm -hmm. I focus them on what is it the visitor yeah. actually wants. Yeah. Yeah, and well, you not only did, did that, they, but why you did they come here? yeah, but you kind of use the eighty twenty principle, and you focus them in on what's the eighty percent that's giving yeah. you the most results, or the twenty yeah. percent that's giving you eighty percent of your results. So, what was another it's, case like that that you changed? I like that. Oh, hey, I, I've done that same. You know, I ask that that same question every time. What are the three or four things that eighty? I said I can't please eighty percent of your right. customers, but I I, I can't please a hundred percent of your customers, but mm -hmm. we can please eighty percent. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I I've done that. In fact, I was recently putting together a presentation and I was looking for slides, and mm -hmm. you know, I just it's almost like every homepage I've ever done. I've just done exactly the same <laughs> thing. Is what's the purpose? Where do the visitors want to go to? Um, how do we make this more visitor centric and less company centric? And this is, a, you know, this is a this is an old lesson. This is a lesson I was teaching back in 1998, mm -hmm. uh, but it still applies just as much today because companies their their default setting is, uh, hey, I, I, I'm trying to give think of an example. Ah, there was there was what well, here's an example. Uh, this is just to show that none of us are as clever as we think we are. Okay. Um, I, I was doing the same thing. In fact, with a group, there were a group of us. We were trying to optimize a website all about hypnosis. It was hypnosis, uh, you know, where you could download these things to hypnotize yourself to lose weight or stop smoking or whatever it right. was. And they had a horrible, horrible homepage. I mean, they literally had like 300 products listed in these small hyperlink text. I've seen those. You know, yeah, all, I know exactly what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, and it was like, we were looking at it and we're saying, we were saying, oh, wow, easy win here. And we went and optimized that page and we, you know, we did that same thing that I always do of saying, hey, you know, what are your four most popular areas? Is mm -hmm. it weight loss? Is it, what, what, what is it? And then we, and we, man, we bombed. <laughs> <laughs> it bombs. Yeah, we could not beat the horrible clunky really website with like every single product they have you know listed on the homepage. Couldn't be. We could not beat it. You know, we did. We were AB split testing that, right. and we tried. And it's just totally counterintuitive. But but it's Weird. an interesting. It was well, an interesting lesson because you can mm -hmm. you can learn some best practices, and a lot of the time they work. But unless you test, you're guessing. Um, and sometimes you'll apply best practices mm -hmm. and it won't work. Uh, really interesting. It was a really interesting lesson, that one. So what were the top most popular products? Oh, I think it was to do, I think it was probably weight loss, smoking and relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, the usual stuff. Yeah. So maybe, what, maybe, money, maybe money was number four. And I'm curious, for people out there who want to do split testing, what do you like to use 
for your split testing? Um, hey, they're all, hey, you can set it up on your own servers. I think, uh, you know, Google Analytics, you can set up an A-B split test and uh, it's not terribly complicated. Yeah. So, you know, and it doesn't cost anything and yeah. it's fast. Hey, I come from the print world in direct marketing. We used to do uh, testing, you know, creative testing on our direct mail pieces. It would cost a fortune. So you know, why, do you double- think, why do you think that bombed? I mean, that's sort of frustrating to have a general principle that you have and then it doesn't work. Why do you yeah. think that particular case it didn't work? No idea. No idea. No no idea. That's frustrating. So, well, no, it's just the nature of the game. What you do is you, you, you apply your best practices. Yeah. You test it. If you don't test, you're guessing. Always. Mm-hmm. If you don't test, you're guessing. If you, in fact, if you don't test, you're, you're an amateur. Yeah. If you, if you want to be professional about this, you have to test yeah. because, mind you, testing is scary because sometimes you, you know, I, I remember I rewrote a series of emails for a company um, and we tested it and uh, that paid me a chunk of money and my new ones didn't beat theirs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I figured out one of the reasons why not later on, but, you know, <laughs> that's the downside of testing as a copywriter. You can't just stand up and say, hey, I'm the bee's knees, trust me. Uh, because mm-hmm. as soon as somebody tests it, they'll find out exactly mm-hmm. how good you are. So, Nick, not. what was another one of those outliers? Like that page that, that you thought, this is going to this is gonna be an easy win, and it bombed. What was another outlier, whether it be a success or not a success? <sighs> Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you another failure. Failures are good. Okay. Um, this was for a company selling golf clubs Mm -hmm. and I took the approach on, this was a sales page. All right. It was basically a landing page. They were being sent there by, you know, pay-per-click advertising. And I opened it basically on the idea of, Hey, it's, it's not your swing. It's your golf clubs. It's you're not the problem. It's not your fault. Yes. And w- which, in a sense, is is not a bad way to go. Yeah. If I'm a golfer, I like hearing that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not your fault. It's you know, it's out of your control. It's not your swing. It's it's the golf clubs. Uh, bombed. And so, what happens when something bombed is I like to go back and we were able to go back and find people who had got into the shopping cart but hadn't purchased. And, and so we had their email addresses and we went back and said, uh, in, which, in fact, we got on the phone with some of them to talk mm-hmm. about this. Mm-hmm. And we were pretty certain at the end that my mistake was I was trying to change their mind that they were actually convinced that it was their swing, mm-hmm. that it was their problem, that maybe they'd invested in that in some ways. They believed it, maybe they'd read a lot about it, maybe experts that they respected and knew better than us had, had told them, yeah, it's your mm-hmm. swing. Mm-hmm. And we came back with this attractive proposition that, oh, no, it's not, it's not your fault, it's the golf club. Mm. Didn't work because we were trying to change their mind. And, and, and that's one of the, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't like failures, but I like failures like that where I learned something. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the learning there is I've passed on, uh, you know, coaching and training and writing with, with other copywriters, is that as copywriters, it, it's, not our, it's not our task to change the reader's mind. Uh, to persuade them, to beat them into submission, you can't, you can't, you can't do it. it, it our, our craft is not a craft of persuasion. What you got to do is you got to find out what they already feel and believe, and then align your message with that. If you try to change their mind or change their beliefs or change their habits, you know you're, you're pushing a boulder uphill. Um, so there's somebody I was trying to work that. I was trying to think of the name before because I knew that I was going to want to quote this. Can't remember the name. I, I like to attribute and give credit for quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, may, maybe someone watching this can uh, can knows who this was. Uh, but somebody in our business once said <clears throat> that our job is to enter into a conversation that is already taking place in the prospect's mind. Mm-hmm. All right, you just slide in, you slide in. So for copywriting, what I always try to do, it's, it's a bit like a Venn diagram. You got, you got two circles. The circles, circle one is the, 
the prospect's kind of belief system, where they're at, what they think, what they believe. Uh, circle two is your client's product or service uh, and what they're offering. And you've got to overlap those and you've got to find a point where they can overlap yeah. so that the product or service actually aligns with what the prospect already thinks and believes. Yeah. Then copywriting becomes not easy, but a whole lot easier. Oh, for sure. I, I, I made I made another mistake. Hey, we're going to do a whole interview here on my let's, biggest mistake. Let's do it. Yeah, we'll get to the successes Nick's, later, but no one cares Nick's, about that. <laughs> yeah, Nick's, Nick's biggest mistakes. Uh, more recently, I did a I did a, a long form sales letter. Yeah. Uh, you know, like a twenty page sales letter online, mm-hmm. and it was for a um, it was for a company in the financial services area, and it was a newsletter. You know, those financial services newsletters. Yeah. And, and one of, one of the one of the things that we were talking about, we looked at, and, and then I, I kind of jumped on was is a hook to get people interested. We wanted to look at uh, the whole issue of the erosion of privacy and freedoms in the U.S. Mm-hmm. You know how how Washington is basically ignoring, you know, what the founding fa- fathers wanted and, and all that stuff. Um, and privacy has gone out the window, our freedoms have gone out the window, and I thought, hey, here's an emotional trigger thing. And, and so I wrote the letter with that as the kind of hook and the theme, um, is that, you know, big bad Washington is out to get you and you got to protect yourself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, didn't work, didn't work. And it, and it turns out, again, in hindsight, because sometimes as a copywriter, when you're doing something, you you become wedded to it. You need to. You, you need to be wildly enthusiastic about what you're doing and believe in it as you're writing. And, and I did. In hindsight, and, and other stuff I've read after that, is, is that Americans are actually strangely unresponsive and fairly passive about the loss of freedoms. And you know what I mean? We're not seeing marching in the streets about loss of privacy or loss of freedoms and the American way and all that kind of stuff. It's happening. We know it's happening. Mm-hmm. But, but Americans are strangely silent about it. And so, again, I realized I've made the, and, and, and again, you get, it's, it's another mistake you make it, it, that you know, any copywriter can make is, like I say, on the one hand, you've got to be enthusiastic about what you're writing. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you've, it's not yourself you need to persuade, <laughs> it's the reader. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be very careful, careful that you're not projecting. You know, I, I'm probably more concerned about loss of privacy and freedoms than the average reader. Mm-hmm. So it's like I made the mistake of writing to myself rather than writing to them. Uh, so yeah, it's easy to make mistakes. So how do you get started on that path? Like, you know, you get wedded to it. You don't know it's officially going to work until you send it out necessarily. You do some market research. I guess two things. What's your process and method for research? And then how do you know to just continue passionately on that path when you have a a topic you're gonna kind of center around a couple of things is my my best work and I think if you talk to successful copywriters and they're honest with you they'll probably say something similar is where I'm working very closely with with my client where I have a good relationship with the client uh, and I'll bounce stuff off and I'll say, hey, what do you think? Or, you know, I'm exploring this approach or these two approaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I get enthusiastic. I try not to get too egotistical about ownership of mm-hmm. an idea. You know, I'll bounce it off the client and we'll talk about it. And mm-hmm. I'll say, hey, if, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. Um, because I want to avoid that problem. Another thing is that uh, if, if a company I'm working for has a research group, I'll say, hey, look, can you guys dig up a whole bunch of research on this? I want to see what's been happening in the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing I might do is, is um, look, you know, do some searches through social media. Uh, what are people, um, you know, what what are people's emotional responses to this topic? Mm-hmm. Um, how how are people writing about it? How are they feeling about it? Because uh, that's from you know from my point of view, one of the great things about social media for me as a tool is you tend to get the raw emotion coming through. Mm-hmm. I mean, you get you get some craziness, but you, you can get <laughs> yes. a feel, for, um, you know, for how what, what people's emotions are and how strong those emotions are. Mm-hmm. So, what's um, one of the so successful ones? A successful we talked about yeah, we talked about some of the uh, the mistakes. <laughs> 
sure you, you've had a lot of successes that go with those. What's a successful one that have, comes to all mind? All right, I'll give you, I'll give you, actually, I'll give you two examples. Okay. Because they're, they're, they're both kind of contrasting in a way. Yeah. Uh, one was early on in my career. It was for a, a one-person company. He was actually a close friend of mine. I, I didn't charge him for this or anything. Uh, it was I was living in London at the time, and he when this is back in the the mid 1980s, and he he was selling essential oils. Hmm. Now they're everywhere today. Back then they weren't everywhere. He was one of the first people to kind of bring essential oils in, <coughs> and he was going basically getting in his car and going to pharmacies hmm. um, in London. And he had a little dis- wooden display box, and he was going to the pharmacist and saying, "Hey, you know," and he'd present his deal. Let's put this on your counter, and blah 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 blah. And we were having a beer one night, and I said, "I said, Graham, you're crazy." I said, "You know, you're driving around place to place." And I said, "What? One in ten people say yes?" And he said, "Yeah, about that." So I said, "What? You're getting like maybe two customers a day?" So I said, "Let me write you a letter." I said, "You get a list of all the pharmacies in London." or chemists as they're known in England, uh, you get me a, a list and I'll write the letter. Uh, so he did. He got he, he, he could put together a list. I wrote a two-page letter, um, basically his same pitch. Mm-hmm. But I went crazy with this thing. Th- this was almost like a parody of your hyped-up sales letter. And it was capital letters and yellow highlighting and starbursts. I mean, it was the whole, the full meal deal. It was like every crazy thing about direct response and my, 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 you know, le- language and tone and pace was like breathless and you know it was just crazy. It was it, it was like direct response on steroids. So he looked at it. He said, "Nick, you're, you're nuts. These are these are professionals. These are you know these are pharmacists." Right. Not, yeah. Right. You know, this is this is the wrong tone for the wrong audience. And I said, Graham, you know, trust me, which I had no right to do because I'd only had about three or four years <laughs> experience at the time. But I said, trust me, go for it. You know, what's the downside? Famous last word, yeah. Trust yeah, me. famous last word, <laughs> trust me. Anyway, he sent it out and his business just exploded. He, he had to hire three people. He had to lease three trucks or all, all like within weeks of that letter going out. Mm. Absolutely transformed his business and uh, i mean it just always makes me laugh because it was like i don't know why i wrote it that way but again hey it's a great example of you just don't know yeah you got to try crazy stuff sometimes and 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 that's that's another bugbear so a a little aside here i get into rants i like go ahead rant away is is what i what i did for him um i'd never have been able to do for a mid-sized company or a large company because mid-sized and large companies are cautious. They have a process. Mm-hmm. They have to sell things up the line. They have to get approval and signatures. Mm-hmm. And if I'd come in with something that was self-evidently off the wall and inappropriate like that for that audience, would never happen. You wouldn't get approved. Wouldn't get approved. As it turns out, it worked absolute gangbusters. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one of the things that drives me nuts sometimes is that the clients are so cautious so tied into process, so anxious not to make mistakes, uh, blot their copybook, um, that what happens is that most, uh, I'll go nuts, most copywriting, most marketing um, is, is mediocre. It's safe. Mm-hmm. It does okay. Um, very, it's very rare that you have an absolute breakthrough because no one's got the nerve to try it. Mm-hmm. They're worried so about that, striking that, out. You can hit the home run, but they're worried about striking out. That's right. That's right. You know, the blot on the copybook, the failed promotion, the absence of the bonus, uh, people thinking, oh, my goodness, his rising star has fallen and all that nonsense, um, which is which, which is a real shame because as a freelancer, I actually, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make a good living working just for tiny companies because they tend not to have budgets. So you want to go up to, you know, I like to go up to medium-sized, larger companies because they got money to spend. But as soon as you get into that, you have to get into safe mode, I got you. which is frustrating. Mm-hmm. So another success. Before you go was, to that, Nick, with all yeah. the success, talk about what were some certain elements in that that worked. Do you remember specifically some of those elements that you put in there that were kind of crazy um, that, that did work? Oh, man. Hey, this is like 30 years ago. I don't have a copy of the letter. <laughs> um, I, just, I just remember the appearance of it. Yeah. And, and I remember that I wrote it. 
-hmm. with that crazily crazy breathless it's like the blue blocker sunglasses mm -hmm. kind of pace mm -hmm. and approach it was you know and he was making crazy claims like this will transform your business this is the year that essential oils that take off rush rush there's, there's only so many pharmacists that are going to be able to carry this thing uh will you be one of <laughs> of only you know 20 pharmacists in the greater london all that kind of stuff you know all yeah. the tricks of the trade of direct response i remember lots of caps lots of bold mm -hmm. indents bullet points yellow highlighter all over the place handwritten like things in the margins it, it was just like i tried to get everything that direct response can do and mm -hmm. cram it all into a two-page letter and that was it now why I, i'm not sure I, I can't remember what my thinking was because it was it was clearly a risk because the audience the, the right. audience actually you know what I, I i know exactly why i did it you see you're jogging my memory now i'd been doing some I was just, I'd been maybe doing direct response copywriting for about a year. <clears throat> and uh, I was working um, in an agency and writing the copy. And our audience was investors who, let's say they had, you know, 100,000 or more to spend. In other words, investors who had money. All right. Not a, no, this wasn't the penny stock crowd. This was people who had money. And, and I was, we had a, we had a client, we had several clients, but one of the clients uh, that I was writing for, uh, and I was writing in a tone that I felt was appropriate for that audience, right. you know, people with money to invest. And uh, one of my colleagues, one of the founders of the agency, great guy, uh, Dave Hawkins, um, he, he used to just slap me around the back of the head. I mean, literally, he would slap me around the back of the head. Really? And he'd say, Nick, we've got a beat your middle class education out of you this isn't you know you're being all very nice and respectful but you're not going to sell a damn thing this way and he said look we've got to hype it up we've got to increase the p pr uh, their pace we've got to make crazy promises we've got to make them think they can make a million dollars by next tuesday if they invest in this and i was saying dave you can't talk to this kind of people in that way and he just slapped me around the back of the head again he said yes you can do it and i did it and we made a fortune for that client and he was right and i suddenly realized wow you really can up the you know the the, the kind of direct response language even with a professional wealthy audience and it's that that i took over to my friend's business mm. and i said well if it worked for investors maybe it'll work for pharmacists yeah uh, and and it did and it did mm -hmm. um but yeah, it was a risk. Yeah, uh, but it was. I have a note in here to bring up Dave Hawkins actually, because you did mention him in the speech that you gave. Because I w I want to ask see who some of your mentors were and what you learned from them. So now is as good a time as any. Uh, before you go into the second success, what else? Okay. Did Dave, what else did Dave teach you? Um, well, you see, Dave came. Dave was before we started this agency. Um, we, he was a vice president at McCann Erickson, a very large agency. Mm -hmm. uh, so he'd been very, very successful. But his background, um, he was from the east end of London and a poor, poor family in a poor part of London. And he grew up as a barrow boy. And a barrow boy is that kid who stands behind, you know, at an outdoor market and stands behind and he's selling the vegetables or yeah. whatever, whatever it is. And he... And those guys, I don't even know if those markets are still around, but I used to go to them, you know, back in the 70s, 80s. And those guys selling stuff, they were consummate salespeople. They would engage you, they would entertain you, they would draw you in, they would make you feel special, that actually make you think that the price they were offering was just for you. You know, they, they, they were doing everything that a good copywriter does and, mm -hmm. and, and great entertainers. And you bought stuff but almost like in payment for the entertainment that they were offering. Um, and that was his background. He was a really good salesperson. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he basically taught me direct response copywriting. He wasn't a copywriter himself. Yeah. Um, but, but he just knew. He knew how it went, how to catch people's attention, how to hold their attention how to you know draw them in and and, and build on the sale and, yeah. and and close the sale so what did he do to catch people's attention or to, what did he teach you to catch people's attention well i think he did he just got me to to raise my voice and introduce a little drama you know he said you know you you, you can't sell stuff like you're 
sipping a glass of sherry with some fellow in a club, you know, in West London, you know, you got to sell to someone like you've, you're on your fifth beer and you're really excited about it. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you got to break through your English reserve mm-hmm. and, and really get excited about this. Um, and, and, and again, I think he was the one who taught me the whole idea of when you're writing, you're, you're not writing, you're never writing to an audience or a demographic. Uh, you know, you're writing to one person. Mm-hmm. You're writing to an individual. And he said, just imagine that they're sitting across the table in the pub or the bar. Or, and he said, look, he said, if, you're, if, if you've been to a movie and you think it's really great and you love that movie and then the next day you're sitting in the pub across from three friends that haven't seen it and, and you want to persuade them that, oh, you've got to see this movie. Like, and he said, well, what you're doing is you're selling you're selling them on the movie. You, you know, you're not going to get anything out of it. Right. They're just your friends. You're talking, but you love that movie, and, and you want to sell them on it. And just listen to your voice. Listen to how you do it, because because mm-hmm. that's copywriting. Mm-hmm. Is is when you're enthusiastic about something. So he 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 taught me to get some life and vigor and, and enthusiasm into my writing. You know, five beers instead of one sherry. So do you ever just have five beers just to see how your copywriting gets? Oh, we always used to have. <laughs> we always used to have five beers. <laughs> more, more. This was back in the eighties. Okay. The standard operating procedure for working in an ad agency in the eighties in London was: you got to work at nine thirty. Mm-hmm. You did some work. Twelve thirty, you went out for a three-hour liquid lunch, staggered back, pretended to do a bit more work, and then went back to the pub until it was closing time. Uh, and that was pretty much it. Uh, so, so basically, we just did a bit of work in the morning. <laughs> but yeah, I think a lot of good ideas came out of the uh, the lunches. But so, who else were your mentors, Nick? I know you I think you mentioned Peter, right? Peter Smitherman. So he was. Well, when I started out, I kind of started out by accident because I didn't have a job and I needed a job, and I didn't even know ad agencies existed. I kind of stumbled into it. And then when I got to an ad agency, I kind of stumbled into the creative department and suddenly realized they had people who were copywriters. And I thought, hey, well, that sounds like money for nothing. You know, I can do that. And it turned out I could do that, which was great. And I was paired, you know, I was about 22, 23. And I was paired with this kind of veteran uh, art director designer called Peter Smitherman. Great guy. Great. And fortunately, we got on very well from right from the get go. Um, and he taught me to respect the craft, mm-hmm. to never be satisfied with second best or third best. Um, and, and one of the ways he did it is we would sit down and we'd do, you know, hey, this is the days where it was a big square table. He sat on one side, me on the other side. He had his big pad of paper and his magic markers. I sat on my side with my big, heavy uh, manual typewriter and uh, that's how we worked and so we used to make he used to take incredible care over everything we did we did a lot of print ads those early days I was doing print ads for magazines mm-hmm. and he would what we'd do is we'd, we'd make it what he described as good enough for the client and then we'd make it a bit better so the client was amazed by how much work we'd put into it and he said right that is above and beyond what the client would be happy with. Mm-hmm. And it, I'd say, right, time to go home. He said, nah, I mean, figuratively. Uh, he said, now we're going to make it even better just for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes we'd spend as much time just for us as we did for the client. Mm. And he, he would go nuts. He'd like, I'd write a headline, you know, across this advertisement. And, and the layout required the headline to be just one line. I'm thinking of a particular ad. Yeah, it tell me one, about it. Yeah, yeah. It was. It had an image across the top, a headline, and then four columns of copy underneath. Mm-hmm. You want the headline to be uh, one line, not two lines, and he wanted it to be a certain font size. And he said, Nick, he said this thing we done for the client. He said it's great. It's great. They're going to love it, and they did. Uh, or they would have done if they'd seen that early version. Uh, but he said, you know what to make this even better from a design point of view? And that is if we can make the headline same size but full width across those four columns of copy. Because at the moment it's a little indented. He said, can you rewrite that so it's about four characters longer? 
What was the was, headline? What was the original headline? Do you remember? No. I have no idea. Oh. Have no idea. Well, remember, this is like my earliest teacher. This is, we're going back 35 years here. Um, but I, I remember those occasions where he'd do things like, you know, I just need, you, you got to write a headline that's as good or better than this one, but about three characters longer. So I'd like, fine. You gotta just add three dots? Like, what do you do? Certainly not. No, I'd rewrite the headline so oh. it was three characters longer. And, and you know what? It was usually a better headline because he made me work harder at it. Mm-hmm. Then he'd do things like he'd say, hey, Nick, you see on the third column of, of body copy here, do you see how the first line is not the full width? He said, it, it kind of looks messy. He said, I like the first line of a new column to be the full width. And this was justified left. It wasn't kind of forced, justified both sides. Mm-hmm. So he said, you need to rewrite so that the rewrite that so that so he was down to like these minute points of appearance uh so that because he he viewed it as as like a craft and an art he wanted the ad to look perfect mm-hmm. and he was he, in that sense he in some sense he was a pain i mean the, this is back in the days where you know no computers so they the 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 ad before it went to the printer came to us as a pmt photomechanical transfer and there were these guys who, the markup artists, who would take a razor blade and glue and stuff and put the put the text on boards. And he'd he'd, he'd like send it back and say, you know what? In this type font, uh, I don't really like the distance that of the the full point at the end and, and the word preceding. It's it's a little wide. And he'd send it back so they could get out their little Stanley knives and cut out a little bit of paper, a little cut bit of card there, move the full point in, like sometimes it'd be like half a millimeter, quarter of a millimeter. Wow. And it'd come back and say, nah, it looks better. That looks better. So so he, he told me that it's, it's worth working at. If you're going to do it, it's worth really doing it well. Mm-hmm. And for sure, you get a lot more satisfaction. And hey, it's got to work as well. Um, but I mean, one of the things I learned there is is that the more care you take, uh, the more likely it is to work. And have I got time for a quick rant here? Yeah, go ahead as long as you want. All right. What quick time r- do we have? How much time do you have until just so I keep an eye on it? I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, cool. So I, I've done a lot of not back then, but in the, over the last ten years, a lot of teaching other copywriters, a lot of training other copywriters, yeah. a lot. Of other copywriters I've had other copywriters do uh, work for me so they send in their, their work to me and uh, most of them the vast majority of copywriters most vast majority of the work I receive drives me nuts because uh, they could they could do some time with Peter Smitherman is that now they have I'm, time with Nick though yeah but I did Peter Peter was really nice with me um, I, I tend not to be quite so nice because it, it really ticks me off mm-hmm. is that a lot of the time I think this person is lazy. Mm-hmm. They have no pride in their craft. They've sent me a first draft. I've seen some of their work. I know how well they can write. This is nowhere close to being as good as they can be. Why would they send it to me? Why, why would they do that? I mean, is it so? Is it such a kind of cheap, throwaway, crappy kind of thing that you're doing? If if that's the case, why are you doing it? You know, don't be an accountant or something if you don't care about whether you present your best work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I say I'll say to them, I say, well, the, the headline. How many how many how many times did you write that headline until you got to this one? And it'll be it'll be their first headline they tried, or, or second, or third. Me, you know, I'll rewrite a headline twenty times, thirty times. <clears throat> if I write a a 20 page sales letter and I go back and I realize that I've just got off on the wrong foot on page one I'll rewrite it mm-hmm. I'll rewrite I'll rewrite the whole thing I won't get paid twice but I'll write twice yeah because I I'm not gonna send in work that is not hey it's not not everything I send in is the best thing I've ever done but it's you know, it's certainly not shoddy, but but so much stuff I see is, it just drives me nuts. Like, why would you do it? Why why would you do it? Why why would you not do your best? Mm-hmm. Why would you not put in the work? And then sometimes someone will say, oh well, yeah, but the fee on this it just doesn't. And I'll say, you know what? 
that's not an excuse. Mm. It's, re- it's it, your reputation it, in the end, too. So it, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're messing with your reputation. But also, if if you're going to do good work, that has to come into your pricing. Is that if you if you if if the fee is two thousand dollars, and you think, hey, for two thousand dollars, I can only do one draft, don't take the job. Right. Don't take, why would you do a job that makes you look crappy? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that drives me nuts. So Nick, what was? And I want to get to your second success, but now I, I, have, I, have I, haven't, even had a, I haven't even had a beer yet. I well, have a few. You know, it's fine. Go grab one. <laughs> um, it's kind of early for that, but I guess not not according to your London days. But um, so, you know, back to that, what's an example of recently where maybe like a first, if you can remember a first version of your headline and then like the 20th version of the headline. So we can kind of see, okay, it started like this and it ended like this. Are there any you can recall that, or maybe just start with the, the one that you did 50 times. Oh, man. Hey, I got a terrible memory for that kind of thing, um, but I know that e- even if I'm writing an article or a post, yeah. my my first headline is always the placeholder. It's like, okay, here's what I want it to be about. Mm-hmm. So I write it down, mm-hmm. and then I start writing. And all even even writing a post, I go back and say, you know, and I and I know that the headline's crap. It's just a placeholder. So I go back and I change it, and I'll change it maybe. A, and and this, this isn't like on copywriting work this is just on a poster or an article yeah i'm looking at a bunch of your articles you have like uh long copy or short copy which works best the agony of trying to get noticed on social media and what to do about it uh three reasons why i'll be joining you for four weeks and to content marketing mastery with brian clark so yeah i see yeah any one of those well certainly the um oh you see i've forgotten them all already except for the last one (laughs) I got a terrible memory. The long copy uh, or short copy, which works best? I'm sure that's a popular topic, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. But it, and all right, so that so that one is, it's a topic that, it's always a win, writing about it because there are you know that there are so many people who will swear blind that long copy works, and that there's an equally mm-hmm. vocal group who think they're full of it and that short copy works best. So. It's a kind of it's a kind of win win when you write that particular article mm-hmm. because you know people are going to get passionate about it. Debate, and, and yeah. It's, yeah, there's going to be a debate about it. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot, a lot of the time that the headlining content is all about engaging the reader's interest before they even get into it. You know, mm-hmm. like the three reasons why. I mean, everyone does it. They do it because it works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, that that the how to. Um, but I think in the copywriting, if I'm selling something. Um, the headline is, oh man. Well, first of all, is is you gotta you gotta have an idea. You gotta find the idea mm-hmm. for a piece of copy. Mm-hmm. There, there's one thing. Um, What's one know, of mistake. those? What's one of those lately? Stop or... asking that. I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the mistake I made where I thought the one thing was the, uh, you know, loss of privacy and, and rights of the citizen. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the one thing. And mm-hmm. it was the one thing I wrote about. I just happened to be wrong. It didn't mm-hmm. connect in the way I, I hoped it would connect. Um, a lot of the time, often bullied by clients, copywriters will say, okay, here are the, the four things or the seven things. Um, it really works as well as having one idea. Mm-hmm. You know, here, here's the idea. Here's what we're going to go. Here's what we're going to go with. Hey, maybe I should go into my other success. Go ahead, do it. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, this was for a large. I'm not going to name it, but a large American national newspaper. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the top three uh, in 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 terms of reputation. And this is going back a few years, but they, they, they were basically wanting people to, more people to sign up for the digital version. All right, online version of the newspaper. And in fact, I was working um, as part of a, a small team on this. There were three of us. There was, there was me doing the writing, there was a designer, and there was an optimization guy. And we were tasked with increasing uh, the conversion rates from their sign up page to subscribe 
and there were various offers like you know the you know the one month the six month the one year uh, and various um things like you know just sign up now and you'll get three weeks free all that good stuff <clears throat> anyway we we did various things we we changed the the layout uh i rewrote the copy and we actually shortened the the process they had this awful clunky it was like a seven page you say yes on this page now give us your credit card next page now give us the it was very very long and we brought that down to three pages um and we increased the conversion rate of visitors to that page to people who signed up for a paid subscription by over 500 percent wow which is phenomenal because yeah. often people will go gaga for like a five percent increase right. you know it can make a difference in terms of cash yeah uh, 500 I think it was more like 550 percent huge increase. yeah um, the copywriting alone I think we increased it by something like 70 percent um, the layout increased things I think by something like 200 percent um, so so that was that was a fantastic win and it was it was interesting to me for a few reasons um, one is that the first version actually if you looked at it didn't appear so bad I mean, it didn't it wasn't it wasn't a horrible sign up page um, and I think a lot of the time marketers and copywriters we look at it could be a subscription page or a sales page or, or whatever kind of page where you want somebody to take an action and it doesn't look so bad so you tend to leave it mm. and there are hundreds of millions of pages out there on the web that are hey that looks okay we'll leave it and little do you know that you've got a potential 500 percent conversion increase on that which is like Hey, for this company, it, it translated into millions and millions of dollars right. in extra revenue. Um, so it was interesting. It was quite a lesson to me that, wow, you know, there are so many pages we could do this to mm. where people say, okay, the page is up. It looks good. It follows best practices. Job done. No, it's not. There's money under the mattress. You're just leaving it there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I liked about that was it, it actually took three of us to do that. And in my experience as a copywriter um, is that, yes, hopefully by now I've, I'm fairly good at my craft. But my biggest success is uh, always come out of teamwork to some degree. Hmm. Um, hey, I got a tip here for copywriters. Yeah, love them. Um, the most important thing, I think, in terms of my success has been to find great clients to work with. You, you, you cannot do your best work for a bad client. You just can't do it. They, 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 you know, it just doesn't work. Uh, you'll only do your best work with a really good client, a client who understands the value you bring to the table, a client who's going to push you, a client who's going to teach you, a client who can be bothered to spend time with you. Um, and, and when I look back, you know, Probably living out of probably four, three of you know, principally three relationships, three clients, clients ongoing. You know, I'm not spending, I'm not wasting time looking for new clients every week. I just like to, if I can find a new client, a really good client, once every two years, that's great. It's all about the relationship, you know, and, and the better the relationship, the better the client, the smarter the client, the better your work will be. Impossible to do your best work for a crappy client. And, and when I look at the web now and, and copywriters coming on stream like, and, and they're getting work from you know, guru.com or, or something like that, I'm not saying those are all bad clients, but it's the bottom of the pool. They're looking for cheap copywriters. The... The, the, the people hiring often really don't understand marketing. Certainly don't. You, you can't do your best work in, yeah. in that environment. You can't do it. Uh, I've all, you know, I always say to people, in, invest every time it takes to find really good clients. Hey, and it doesn't happen every time. I've worked for lots of clients who weren't great. I do the work. I'm always looking for a great client to work with. Because that's absolutely my best work has been done for my best clients. So Nick, how does your, how does the work um, change or progress when you have a client for a year, two years, three years, five years? What kind of stuff do they have you doing like in the beginning and 
and throughout? Very often, the, the work that I do doesn't change that much. The relationship changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll get the phone call saying, hey, Nick, I was in a meeting and we were talking about ABC. What do you think? So now they're treating me more like a kind of partner, a consultant, a guy down the corridor that, you know, they respect my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, listen more. I'll listen more. Uh, I'll provoke more. I'll put myself in positions where I'm perhaps more likely to make a mistake. In other words, I'll get out of the cautious. If it's the first client, first time with a client, you know, you don't really want to mess up. <laughs> That's a good, uh, uh, <laughs> good advice. So, so you tend to be a little safe or a little cautious. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you do something for them that works. But if, you, if you've been a little braver and gone out on the edge a bit, you might have created something that works a great deal better or might have bombed. And it's tricky to do that with the client. But if, if, I've, if I'm working with someone where I've worked with them for years, and I'll say, hey, Jack, this could either work incredibly well or is going to absolutely bomb and now you know they know me by now and and I'll, I'll i'll come out straight with it and then i'll tell them what the idea is and i'll say you're right so it's like a terrible idea but it might actually work so now there's this trust and there's some um, there's the the freedom to fail as it were or the freedom to really succeed mm -hmm. is that you can't do that with a with a with a client where you don't have a relationship you don't have trust you don't have mm -hmm. a history mm-hmm so Nick, you know, what are some of your favorite headlines that work best or favorite hooks? And you wrote We Print Stuff. <laughs> this is my, this is my, um, so I was speaking at a direct marketing conference and uh, my slot was just before lunch and we broke for lunch. And then there's this, the hall, uh, you know, the trade booths in the hall. Right, yes. Uh, and this was a, it was actually down, it wasn't a big area, it was uh, not like a big ballroom, it was actually down a kind of wide corridor, and they, they were all up against the wall, and there was, if, so they, they had the tables, and then they had these like banners above, you know, saying company name and what we do. So you could look down the whole corridor, see what people did. Mm. And there was the usual nonsense. The, the the one I remember, I remember two most. One was so there, this was direct response. So there was there was printers, mailing houses, list brokers, all these different kind of service providers. And and there's one that was like tomorrow's printing technologies today. You know, it's the kind of thing that makes me want to hurl. <laughs> you know, it's just. It's just a copywriter trying to be clever rather than a copywriter trying to be helpful. Right. Uh, so, and, and then there was this huge crowd around this one table, and I was looking down, and I looked up, and on his banner, it just said, we print stuff. And I thought, perfect, perfect. You know, and, and such a contrast to tomorrow's printing technology, like that. Um, <laughs> and, and, there's, and there's a copywriting lesson there, is, is that clarity always trumps cleverness. Uh, and as copywriters, particularly starting out, there's a temptation to think, oh, I've got to demonstrate my copywriting chops. Uh, I've got to come up with something clever. You know, maybe it should have a pun in it. Or, and No. You know, just simplicity, clarity. It's, it's Beginner copywriters always focus too much on how to write something rather than on what to write. You know, 90% of it is saying the right thing. 10% is saying the right thing in a really beautiful way. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that that kind of I'm I, I just love this. You know, almost every headline I can think of is they're just simple, simple, mm -hmm. best ones. So, Nick, you obviously work with a lot of copywriters, help a lot of copywriters, coach a lot of copywriters. What are some other big mistakes? you see people making, you know, one was obviously they're not working hard enough. They need to just write, you know, more versions of their headline or whatever it is. And, and one thing you mentioned was, or you said was pandering to the client. Tell me about oh, that. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, hey, hey, it's a tricky one. You're being paid by the client. You've got to right, pay the client. Right, it is tricky. Yeah. They're, it's tricky. They're, they're giving you the money. Yeah. Um, but, it, it, it's all in the it's all in the mind it's like you see a lot of copywriters they'll get hired by the client and they'll say um, I'm now 
at the client's service. I'm their servant. Um, and this is where I usually start moving into bad language, but I'll spare you that. Whatever, whatever you want, whatever language you, so, you want to use. So, at which, at which point I say, bleep off. I'm not their servant. I am the expert they have hired to help them out with something they don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So I, I tend to push back a lot if mm-hmm. a client uh, comes up with a silly notion. Like, oh, we're going to do an ad. Let's let's try and sell all thirty-five of our products in this one ad. Um, you know, no, I'm not your servant. I'm not going to say yes just so that there's no trouble about my check. I'm going to say no. That's the stupidest idea I ever heard, and here's why. So, except in hypnosis, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except when I get it wrong, <laughs> like in hypnosis and golf, where I get it wrong. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's if you. Hey, you can you can pick up a paycheck, but you won't end up as a very good copywriter, and you mm-hmm. won't end up with the best clients right. if you're constantly saying yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir. Mm-hmm. Because, um, in the words of a, a fine English copywriter, Drayton Bird, and again, I, I won't use I interviewed exact Drayton. Words. Yeah, right. So Drayton classically, uh, we were both speaking at a conference, uh, and he, he, he took away the prize for being the first person to use the F word on the stage at that conference ever. <laughs> I could see that. I could see that. And yeah. uh, so, and this was before this was this was before bar time. And so he, he said, "You have to understand." He said, "Most companies know F all about marketing," uh, and some people are a little upset by that. Uh, and, he, you know, there's an element of tongue in cheek, but there's also a big element of truth in that. Mm-hmm. Is that, you know, if, if you've taken the trouble to learn copywriting, then you've learned quite a bit of marketing in there. Yeah. Most of your clients don't know as much as you do. You know, smart company, senior person, yes, they do. But most companies uh, that don't have official marketing training or copywriting training, and you go in thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I've got to kowtow to this client because they are the client, therefore they know. Well, you know what? Very often they don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, that's a sweet spot for me is, is I love it when a client will, when I'm talking with a prospective client and they will say, you know what? We just don't know this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a green light to me. Is that wonderful? A client is open. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than the tightly wound client who says, look, we have a system, we have a style guide, we have a process, we need you to fit in. We need you to be a team player. (laughs) Clearly, they don't know me at all. Um, (laughs) But, you know, I I love it when when a client is is smart enough to be open and and they're saying, look, we're coming to you because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just their language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying. You know, I think um, if you talk to my clients, I'm very respectful, very professional. I give them more than they ask for. I treat the relationship lightly, uh, but I don't walk into it assuming that I just have to say mm-hmm. yes, sir, to everything yeah. they say. Yeah, because that that that's not how you create great work. Yeah, you, you create great work by pushing. Nick, so one thing you mentioned with your good clients, you're looking for just one good client every two years. You did mention in there you like some pushback. So when do you tend to accept some pushback with the process? Um, hey, it's easiest for me when I when I know the person and I respect them and I know they know. So recently I wrote a, a sales letter. And I said, and he wrote it back. He wrote back a few days later. Uh, and basically, he was saying, you know, it was a 20 page letter. After about the third page, he stopped making comments. He sent me the comments. You know, he'd done the comment thing down the side of a Word document. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm going to stop here. I'm sure you know what I'm getting at. Um, and I did. And, and it was one of those awful things where. You know, I looked at him, and he was he looked at it, and he was absolutely right. Because what I'd done is I'd written the letter. The, the structure was fine. The idea was strong. It was fine. Everything was fine, except that I'd kind of hit it in second gear instead of fifth gear. I I hadn't. It, oh man, how do I describe this? 
you know, it was kind of the the whole thing was the story was glowing rather than burning bright. It was I just had, and, and I, I recognized it and I thought, man, that pisses me off that I hadn't seen this. He's, yeah. He saw it and he was basically saying, Nick, this is just. You know, he he was saying, "Hey, it's beautiful writing." He said, "The idea is perfect, but you just you just you could make this so much stronger." You so how do you so do that? Right? I rewrote it. I recognized what he said. I thought he's absolutely right, and I went back. I rewrote the whole thing. Um, much stronger, faster pace, much stronger. You know, and I went back through the research again, looking for better bits of information, better quotes that I could use stronger. A punch here. Mm-hmm. It just lacked the first draft. Like lacked punch. So, for me, um, being the arrogant twit that I am, sometimes uh, pushback from clients. If if I don't kind of respect the client, yeah. it, 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 it's tricky. Mm-hmm. Which is why I like to work with great clients because you know, of the say three or four people that I work with regularly now, any of them can push back at me, and I respect them enough. To yeah. pause and think. Hey, now sometimes I'll push back in return. Right. On this occasion, on this occasion, as soon as I got past page one, I just I knew he was right. I thought, man, how could I not have seen that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's why it is like, if you want to be a good copywriter, you got to work with good clients. Mm-hmm. See that that second draft I did was way way better. Nick, in the in some of your videos, you mention the delusional self. <laughs> the power of self-delusion. So, so, tell me about your thoughts on that. Well, in in my coaching work, uh, I'd, I'd work with a lot of copywriters. Some who were just starting out, some who'd be doing it for a little while. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them, you know, I'd say, "Hey, why don't you go and work for? You know, why don't you go and approach whatever the New York Times or Apple or Microsoft?" And they'll say, "Oh man!" And, and it's like this whole "I'm not worthy" thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not good enough. I'm not experienced mm-hmm. enough. Um, and so when I was coaching, uh, you know, part of my task was say, you know what, you, first of all, you, you actually are good enough, but you've also got to get yourself in a mindset where you, you believe in yourself enough. And, and part of it, and, and I kind of jokingly call it self-delusion because it's worked really well for me Mm -hmm. see i I think back to my early 20s um i was working for an agency and we pitched for the apple business direct response business for apple back then and we got it and and i did the creative pitch i was up there as as far as i was concerned i was god's gift to just about anything in Mm -hmm. terms of um you know i thought i was absolutely remarkable uh as i look back now with what I know now compared to what I knew then, I didn't know anything then. It was all, it wasn't, I wasn't being dishonest, but I, I kind of deluded myself into thinking I was remarkable. All right. So <laughs> it's better than the opposite though. It, it's better than the opposite. And, and it's really important. There's an important lesson here. Another way I describe it is that, you know, you can get up in the morning. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror, first thing in the morning before my first coffee. Um, you know, it's not a very impressive sight. That's why I don't even bother looking in the mirror. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's just me, warts and all. And it's, right. if, I, if I'm talking to a client, that's a whole different story. So there's my personal persona, mm-hmm. all right? My personal persona is, is me at home, the guy who looks terrible in the morning, the guy who has to take the garbage out, the guy who has to unblock the downstairs, bathroom toilet whatever it's that guy it's that guy right then there's my professional persona yeah uh which has to be somebody totally different it cannot be you know i I might feel terrible one morning you know it's been a bad weekend the weather's bad the dog's sick my mother's been mean to me over the phone whatever it is and you've all right that's your personal persona you got to put that aside and you put on this this professional cloak and like in 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 real life business like people who have jobs it it actually there's a process there you actually get dressed for work you put on smart clothes uh you get in your car or on the bus or whatever you go to work you have an an office or, or, or a desk you have these trappings it's your business um 
business clothes, it's your business environment. And they, they kind of lift you from that personal you to the professional you. Mm-hmm. Hey, the reverse, we'll go to the end of the day. You can have, you can have the CEO of uh, you know, a Fortune 20 company and he's driven home, you know, everyone's been terrified of him all day. And he's driven home in his limo and let off. And he walks in the front door and his teenage son's backpack's lying in the hallway. And the guy says, hey, come and pick up your stuff. And the teenager says, whatever. Right. Like, nobody says whatever to that guy in the office. All right. There's personal persona, professional persona. For sure. Uh, as, freelance, as freelancers, everyone says, oh, I can go to work in my pajamas. Well, you can, but the danger is is that you're bringing your personal persona to work. Mm-hmm. So I was actually working with a coaching client on this, uh, and she was very capable. Uh, and we had this self-same conversation, and, and she had to talk to – she had this prospective client that she really, really wanted. So the next week's call, she uh, rang her up and said, well, how did it go? And she said, inc- she said I nailed it, and I got the client. So excited. And I said, well, tell me about it. And she said, well, that day, and and this was all by phone from home, she did this. She said, that day I got up and I got into business, I got dressed in business clothes. I put my makeup on, my everything as if I were going to a meeting in downtown Manhattan. I actually created the role for myself. And then I got on the phone. And she said, my self-confidence was way up there. Um, and you got to, do, hey, you, or you can think of it in terms of acting. You know, you'll, you'll get, you've got to, you got to act the role right. of the strong, confident. Otherwise, it, it's so easy as a freelancer to feel small. You know, big people with big titles and big offices and big companies. And you're the little guy in his pajamas. It's very easy to Mm -hmm. feel yourself in in, in the junior position there. So either, you know, get dressed up or get your mind into a different place or, like in my case, become comfortably deluded and and get into a place where you speak to them as an equal. Right. Uh, It makes a huge difference. You get better clients. You get better work. You get to charge a lot more. Very hard to charge a decent good fee if you're this diminutive person, this servant in her pajamas, much easier if you're this powerful business person who happens to work from home, yeah. who's got something to contribute to the company that the company does not have internally. You have, as a copywriter, you have an expertise that is essential to their success. Copywriting is essential to every company's success on the planet. Yeah, for sure. Company cannot exist unless it sells its stuff. Almost no companies can sell their stuff just face to face. There have to be has to be words. It is one of the few essential ingredients in any company. If you're an expert, if you're better than anyone within the client company at doing that, you are in a position of enormous power. Most copywriters don't grasp onto that. Mm-hmm. That that they they go on to you know they, they'll get a they'll approach to a small company or they'll get on Guru.com or whatever, and they'll play the servant and they'll get paid pennies. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Yeah. Nick, what after 35 years as a copywriter, do you still hit up against any challenges? What challenges do you hit up against now compared to early on? Well, there's kind of inner game and outer game challenges. What I was just talking about was the inner game, yeah. winning the inner game where you feel powerful and confident. Um, I don't feel that way every day. You know, I, I wake up, you know, there are days where I think, oh, my God, I'm, I'm a fraud. This time in the year, I won't have any clients. You know, we, I guess most of us have days like that. Yeah. So, yeah, you've always, you've always got to watch the inner game. you gotta, you got to watch for that because as yeah. soon as you feel that way, it comes true. <laughs> Both ways, it comes true. I mean, it really does. Um, How do you combat that? Um. I know you read Some, a lot. Sometimes I read a lot, a lot. Uh, some sometimes I, yeah, I read a lot, and sometimes I'll read. You know, I tend not to. I don't really read a lot of books on copywriting. I read a lot of books on business. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, but I mean, if if I really find myself thinking that I'm pathetic and useless and about to lose my work, um, then I just think back to, well, wait a minute. You know, I did that job, I did that job, I 
got all these successes. Got all these awards, which are all based on results. I actually, I actually, whatever I think can do this. I am good at this, even if I'm feeling very low ebb right now. Mm -hmm. So I, ju I just use past work as a reminder that I can actually do it. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. Yeah. So what are some must reads for people for business books? Because I know, I think I heard somewhere you you read about a hundred books a year. Yeah, probably a combination yeah. of fiction and nonfiction. So, what are your favorite yeah. business ones, business books of all time? You should have asked me to prepare for this. I told you I don't re I don't remember things. I don't remember I don't remember names. I don't remember the names. What are you reading? What are you reading lately? Ah, uh, hang on. Yeah, pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can find it. I'm the same way. I have to actually look and actually, see. It's not the. It's not. It's not the one I was. It's not the one I was looking for. But this is uh, Black Swan. Okay. Have you heard of that? Yeah. 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 So actually, there's a series of three, the, the Nassim Nicholas Taleb. It's the, um, actually, I think the third book in the series I found the most interesting. Actually, the third book, which I can't even remember his name, um, I read it three times straight through. Really? Yeah. Well, it was one of those books where I read it through and there was some really good stuff in there. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's an arrogant so-and-so, but he's, he's very smart. I mean, he's very dismissive of everyone else in the universe. Um but, yeah, I read through the book and I thought, man, that was interesting. And then I got that thought, but you know what? I, I think I missed a lot. And I read through it, and it's true. I'd missed a lot and actually then read it a third time wow. to get the most out of it. Um, so that's not that's more a book about kind of economics, philosophy, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hey, I, I write. I, I read a book recently about quantum mechanics. Um, so I have a very broad range, and mm -hmm. that's just the nonfiction. Mm-hmm. What about uh, colleagues? So, do you any of your copywriter colleagues, books, or any authors that you that copywriting you, wise? Yeah, like copywriting wise, um, any recommendations on on that for people? Uh, like I said, I don't read a lot in that area. Yeah. Um, I kind of do it, but don't read about it. the The one book that I have read on copywriting is called "The Copywriter's Craft" by Alistair Compton. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was first published must have been in the 80s because that's when I first read it. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's more of a that is hey people will recognize from that my respect for the craft. He has enormous respect for the craft mm -hmm. of copyright. Um, that's more kind of print. It's not direct response copywriting. It's more print copywriting book. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the one that sticks in my memory. Mm -hmm. So you know, Nick, since it is Inspired Insider. My question is about your lowest moment. Tell me about your lowest moment and how you push forward through the, that particular tough time. Um, well, there have been professional low moments where I somehow managed to allow myself to get into a bit of a slide. Probably the toughest was actually a, a personal moment that was this is going back over a decade now but i mm -hmm. lost two very close family members within a few months of one of each other oh wow um and that knocks you off your feet oh for sure and of course if if, I, if i'd worked with a um an employer i'd probably have got you know two weeks or a month off or something and stuff but as a freelancer you don't get that luxury <coughs> so certainly there was uh, time you know a little bit of time i had to take off it's tough uh, to focus yeah, that, when that stuff happens. It's probably really tough to focus well, yeah. on your work. Yeah, it is. It 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 does. It certainly I wasn't at my best. Um, but I, but I think what I fell back on, what I fell back on then was just actually the routine of work. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty structured in my work days. I, I'm not one of these on the beach in Starbucks copywriters. Um, you know, I sit down at work to start work at the same time each morning I look at my to-do list I look at my calendar and I work I'm actually very structured and, and the busier I am the more tightly structured mm -hmm. my work day is in fact 
um, some people where I've discussed this in depth that consider me obsessively structured hmm. and self-disciplined in how I work. Um, I actually, I, I segment my day. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. If I have, let's say I have two large clients, two large projects running at the same time. Um, I will then devote the morning to one client, the afternoon to the other client. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sit down at my desk. Uh, the first thing I do is I deal with some email, anything that is phone messages, whatever I need to get out of the way. Uh, then I then I shut down all of that stuff, shut down social media, shut down email. And, I, and then I'll have a time block, say from 10 to 12, where I'm going to be writing for this client. What I do is then I treat that block of time exactly the same as you would treat sitting an examination. In other words, you start at precisely 10, hmm. you finish at precisely 12, mm -hmm. and you don't do anything else in between. If you're sitting in an exam at college, you don't. You don't go out and get a snack. You don't go for a walk. You don't answer the phone. You don't check your Facebook page. Right, yeah. It's an exam. I like that mentality, yeah. You, you, you sit down and you do it, and, and you start at 10 and you finish at 12, and you give yourself a certain amount of work to achieve by that 12 o'clock deadline. And the same with an exam. You tend to, with most exams, you tend to finish pretty close to the end point. Because in your mind, you, you fit the time to what you got to do, and right. it fits in. Right. Um, so yeah, I'll you know, and, and there've been times where I've had to segment into three slices during the day. But I treat you know, and, and then after the ten to twelve, I give myself a break. I have lunch, I check my email again, whatever. I'll relax. I'll go for a walk. I'll whatever. But then if I'm starting again at one thirty, I start. Uh, people know it from me. Like if I have a phone appointment, and it's if, if we if you and I had a phone appointment at ten o'clock in the morning, and I was calling you, and the phone rang, if you looked at your clock, it would be exactly ten o'clock, exactly, mm -hmm. not one minute past or five minutes past. So, mm -hmm. and, and I think when I went through that bad time, and I've gone through other kind of dips professionally, what I do mm -hmm. is I fall back on on structure. I just keep working, keep mm -hmm. working, keep working, keep working, uh, and then wait for things to lift. You made a note. And said, "I'm a farm boy." I am. What does that mean? Well, sometimes I think whatever question anyone would ever ask me, the answer is always the same: is that I was born on a farm. I was one of one of four boys, which meant it was great for my dad because it meant he didn't have to hire people and pay them. Right, <laughs> slave labor, um, child labor. But again, it, it, it there's a there's a work ethic for sure. Being a farm boy yeah. is that. Uh, we had a dairy farm, so mm. you know we'd bring the cows in from the field at five in the morning to the collecting yard, milking. They'd be back at four in the afternoon. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's raining. Doesn't matter whether it's Christmas Day. Doesn't matter whether you got the flu. Doesn't nothing matters. It's twice a day, every day. If it's my turn at five to bring them in in the morning, doesn't matter. You got to do it no matter what. It. You just you know you do the work. Yeah. Um, so so I have a. That was how I was raised, and, and like, hey, I, I think I was thirteen or fourteen before I realized that other kids were given an allowance. Uh, because you know, I guess from the age of eight, I would line up on a Friday afternoon and pick up my little brown envelope of coins. That would, you know, the money I'd get it would be according to the amount of hours I'd put in. Mm -hmm. So you know, as a kid, I was raised is that you know you. You want money, you work. If you don't, don't work, you don't, get, you don't get your brown envelope on the Friday afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a strong work ethic, yeah. I think, that comes out of, uh, out of being raised on a traditional farm. Yeah. So what are uh, other lessons did you learn from your dad in being on the farm? Oh, well, all kinds of stuff. Respect for, respect for animals, respect for nature. Uh, you know, you look after the animals first and yourself second. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff I learned. Uh, hey, you learn all kinds of stuff on a farm. You learn mechanics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, learn, you, you, learn, you learn everything. It's, uh, you know, sometimes my daughter now will be, you know, I'll get my hands dirty in the garden, you know, without gloves. And my daughter will look at me and say, oh, my God, that's so gross. And I'll say, you know what? Not really. You know, when I was your age, I was up to my shoulder in cow poo trying to unblock it. Unblock a drainage, you know, pipe or something in the collecting yard. So uh, yeah, there's there's some good real life lessons. Yeah. So what's the worst thing you experienced on the farm? Oh, lots of worse things. Lots of worse things. <laughs> Getting up really, really early in the morning. 
uh, removing uh, probably about a ton of cow poo wow. from the collecting yard, you know, after milking on a on a wet, icy November afternoon with the wind blowing and you're shoveling this stuff. And, and you don't have a choice. You don't. You can't say, "Oh, look, I've done enough." You just have to do it till the job's done. Hey, there's tons of uncomfortable jobs like getting into the grain silo. Um, you know, the, the big round silos where the grain is yeah. uh, uh, to clean up or there and you're half. Well, actually, lots of people die doing that, but we didn't know that wow. at the time. Um, I mean, there's tons of awful. This this is before any of that health and safety stuff people do these days. That does you know, sound when, pretty horrible. When I, when, I, when I think of the accidents we could have had on that farm, I was driving tractors down the roads when I was like 11 years old. You know, not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. So what yeah. about on the, the contrast that, Nick, uh, one of your proudest moments? Um, I think the proudest moments are probably where I said yes when it would have been much easier to say no. Um, what, what, one example is in the... Hang on a moment. You know, back in the late 80s... Um, I was just starting out as an online writer. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was just writing articles about it and posts about it online. So this guy that was the editor of one of the online magazines that I'd written some articles for, he rings me up and says, hey, Nick, uh, and, you know, are you interested in speaking at a conference? And what had happened is that he was, he, he was meant to speak at the conference and he pulled out. But it was only like two weeks before the conference. So the conference organizer said, look, dude, we've got a contract. If you pull out now, you've got to find a replacement speaker. So he rang me up and said, are you interested? And I said, well, tell me about it. And it was a big marketing conference in Seattle. About 700 people would be attending. Uh, big companies, medium-sized companies, exactly the audience I wanted to get in front of. Uh, trouble is, I'd never done a PowerPoint presentation, and I'd never spoken in front of a group that size. And I didn't actually even have a business at that point, and I didn't actually have any clients, and I didn't have a website, and I didn't have a business card. I had nothing. Um, so I said yes. So I had two weeks to put together this one-hour presentation on writing for the web. Flew out to Seattle, uh, gave the talk. Uh, it wasn't my best talk by any means. It was my first talk, but it was good enough. Actually, I got three clients out of it. Um, but yeah, that, that, that one moment of saying yes, where it would have been really easy and comfortable to say no. Mm -hmm. Um, actually that was, that was the kind of lift off ignition point for my business online. Yeah. Um, every, everything else sprang from that one event <coughs> of that opportunity. And I was lucky. It was one of those things of luck where the guy pulled out and he called me yeah. and said, hey, would you do it? I mean, it's part of it's luck, so, but part of it's not. Well, I mean, he called you, right? So why did yeah. he call you? Well, I don't know. Maybe he was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he called five other people first. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, but no, it, it is it's that interesting, you know, is, is how much of it is luck, how much isn't. It's, right. There's some it, luck. Wasn't luck, it wasn't luck because I grasped it and did it. Yeah. Uh, it was luck in that the opportunity just happened to come by at the perfect mm -hmm. time for me. So mm -hmm. it's always, hey, people say, you know, it's, it's, uh, I guess in a sense is like, <sighs> oh, I'm not sure how to put it. There's, there's an element of luck in there, but it, it's, mm -hmm. uh, what, what you got to do is you got to, you got to turn those moments into an opportunity for yourself. Exactly. Um, and then that kind of turns things around. So, so I think often it's when, it's it, it's probably maybe you know pr proudest is when I could have said no very easily and I said yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, I have one last question for you. I really appreciate your valuable insights. This has been fantastic. Uh, before I ask the question, tell people where where they can find out more about you. Where where they should check out online. You've written a couple books. What what website should they check out? Um, well, I just go to Nick Osborne dot com mm -hmm. and i c k u s b o r n e dot com mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh yeah pretty much i think everything because i you know i do i do copywriting still but i also do a lot of training a lot of teaching mm -hmm. uh, with other copywriters marketers 
Um, so yeah, that's where people can find me, and they can click through there from to Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah. So Nick, my last question is. I thought that was your last question. No, I have one. That that's that doesn't count as a question. <laughs> um, is what parting advice should we should you give people? What's um, one thing that we should, at the end, um, give them? Out of every, obviously everything that you've. Well, you've I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give two or three. Yeah. Uh, one is uh, is that in a game. Uh, as, as a copywriter, like I say, you, you fulfill a, a need that every company on the planet has. Every company needs good copy. Mm -hmm. uh, very few companies have copywriting expertise in-house. So you're providing an essential service. So never, ever view yourself as a servant, an underling, uh, the junior part of the relationship with your client. You have something they need. All right, so treat, view yourself more as the expert. Even, even if you're just starting out, you have something that they need. Even if you've only been copywriting for six months and you've been training or whatever, uh, you probably already know more than that client, that client company knows about copywriting. You have something to, valuable to offer. Mm. So never ever put yourself in a subservient position. All right? Always stand tall because you have something really important to show, you know, to, to a service that's really important to them. Um, you know, never get, don't be browbeaten, don't be pushed down. You're, you're, the, you're the boss. Um, the other thing I would say that, that, that basically is transformed, um, actually, the, the next thing would be do what I did. Um, and I've done the same thing a few times over my career, is say yes when it'd be really easy to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, say yes where it's scary. Say yes when you're scared you might fail. Um, I was invited to speak to uh, Disney. Disney rang me up and said, would you come and do a, a day's training? Uh, and I said, well, who for? And they said, well, it's all of our the senior editors of our major, you know, like, no, no, sorry, it wasn't Disney, it was Yahoo. Uh, you know, Yahoo Money, Yahoo Sports, all that stuff. It's, it's our senior editors. It's huge, yeah. And, and I had this moment of, oh, my goodness. I mean, these are like, in terms of content and stuff, these, are at the, these guys are at the pinnacle. They're at the top of the pile. What could I possibly presume to bring to the table? Mm -hmm. Very nearly said no and, and said yes. And it turns out it was fine because... They have to be expert at five different things. They have staff to look after. They've got seniors to, to you know, senior people to answer to. Their, their day is filled up with all kinds of stuff. I only do one thing, writing for the web. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I knew more than they did, and it worked out fine. Very easy to say no, though, uh, when it feels scary. So, particularly when it feels scary, you should say yes. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing I would say is uh, put a huge amount of effort into getting really good clients. I'll give you another example. I had a coaching client who uh, got on the phone and he says, hey, good news. I, I've got this client who's just a mountain of work, fantastic amount of work. He wants me to write 40 blog posts a week. Whoa. And I said, whoa, that's a lot. I said, how much is he charging? How much is he giving you? And he said, uh, uh, $10 a post. And I was saying, okay. So I said, so basically you are, you've accepted, and I wasn't this blunt, I was kind of nicer about it, but I said, basically what you've done is you, you're now going to be earning minimum wage. Less than probably. Yeah. You, you're going to be, you're going to be working so hard that you won't have the time ever to find a better client because you're going to be working nonstop on minimum wage for this one guy. All right. You've got to be really careful. You know, I said, ring him back and say thank you but no thank you because if you spend a week looking for a better client you know don't earn any this week anything this week but get a better client this week who next week can pay you a lot more yeah and you know you get more value out of that relationship uh just don't get tied into that and and i and i it, People will say to me, hey, it's easy for you to say, Nick. And I, and I get that. I understand that. It's easier for me, you know, because I know lots more people and I've got more experience. Uh, but it is such a trap 
to yeah. get tied into low paying work from mm -hmm. from poor clients uh so i'd really invest in that is, is look for great clients and great relationships and and, and invest in those relationships i mean i I'm, I'm like a when it comes to negotiating a fee you know i'm no pushover you know i want what i know i'm worth and i'll mm -hmm. push for it mm -hmm. once that's agreed i usually give them double what they think i'm going to give them it's it's you know part of the relationship yeah hey I, I just wrote to a client this morning nothing to do with any work we're doing i just heard about something and i thought hey i wonder if that come i wonder if he knows about this because he could find this useful so i just fired off quick email saying hey guys check this out nothing to do you know not paid for nothing to do with work we're doing i just thought hey they might find that useful yeah uh hey it's just all part of the give and take of the relationship yeah. uh, huge difference huge yeah. difference nick You've been fantastic. I really appreciate your time. And have, uh, I been, have, I been, have I been useful? Have I been helpful? Of course, definitely. I hope. I love you pushing back on me too. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, though. It's been an absolute pleasure, Nick. I appreciate it. Well, likewise, I've enjoyed right. it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye.